I find individual men and women that made a difference for Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, we see God's hand in the lives of individuals who did what was right because it was right, regardless of the results, and they made a difference for God. You know, the world as we once knew it has dramatically changed. And this pace of change is so incredibly rapid that if you blink your eyes, you almost miss it. It seems that the foundations of society are crumbling. This has produced an uncertainty, an anxiety, an insecurity on the part of many. Let's look at a few statistics of what's happening in the world. And these statistics almost read like Jesus' words in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13 and Luke 21. If you look, for example, at the statistics on world hunger, 690 million people went hungry in 2019. 2022, it's over 700 million people. 8.9% of all the people in the world today are hungry globally. 19% of the people in Africa suffer from hunger. That's one in every five Africans goes to bed tonight with not enough food. Two billion people in the world are unable to access food that's safe and nutritious. That's two billion people. I mean, that's, that's staggering. 57% of sub-Sahara Africa and Southern Asia aren't, in, aren't able to afford a healthy diet. Jesus speaks about famines, speaks about world hunger. We see that being fulfilled. But let's look at the refugees, the displaced people. Over 108 million people worldwide last year were displaced from their homes as a result of persecution or, or conflict or violence or human rights violations. But let's look at wars around the world. We talked about the war in the Ukraine. Hundreds, thousands dead, tens of thousands more injured. And then you see recently, a week ago today, this last Sabbath, an attack on, on Israel and there now, Iran, China threatening to be involved. United States sending a aircraft carrier support group to the Mediterranean. When you take a look at what's happening in the world from the area of war, did you know that over 500,000 people, a million people this year, will die because of war? And that's tens of thousands more injured. Now, if you add to that, almost 400,000 people dying because of uh, violent crimes. Something's going on in the world, world hunger, refugees, wars. But then you look at natural disasters. You say, well, haven't we always had natural disasters? In 2022, the emergency event database recorded 387 natural disasters worldwide. Do you know that in that one year alone, there were $223 billion spent on natural disasters? Then if you look at the nuclear threat around the world, there's a group called the Atomic Scientists, and they publish every year what's called the Doomsday Clock. And uh, they've just moved up the hands on this Doomsday Clock to 90 seconds before midnight. Now, midnight, of course, is the time what these atomic scientists believe that life on Earth will be extinct. And uh, this is what their global report said. The clock now stands at 90 seconds to midnight, the closest to global catastrophe it's ever been. What does Jesus say about all of this? Take your Bible and turn to Luke, the 21st chapter. What is Christ's message to his people? when we see 
the signs in the natural world, when we see distress in nations, when men and women's hearts are failing them for fear, what is Christ's instruction to us? Luke chapter 21, verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws nigh. When these things begin to happen, are these events taking place all around us today? Are they? When these events begin to happen, do what? Be filled with fear and anxiety because of the events? Look up because what? Your redemption draws nigh. There is an amazing statement that was written well over a hundred years ago in a little series called the ninth volume of the testimonies, page 11. Listen to this one. The agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Read the last sentence with me if you would, please. Great changes are soon to take place in our world and the final movements will be rapid ones. Do we see great changes taking place in the world today? Do we see those changes? And is the pace of change rapidly increasing? Now, as we contemplate the state of our world in these rapidly deteriorating world conditions, it's very easy to become so perplexed, you just throw up your hands and you say, well, there's nothing really I can do about it. I'm simply only one planet, one person on a planet out of control, and uh, that's it. There's nothing I can do. These things are simply happening. I'm reminded of a statement by Dwight Moody, the renowned American evangelist. He wrote these words uh, in his Bible. He said, I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do, and what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. You see, because I can't do everything about all these conditions in the world doesn't mean that I, can ref I should refuse to do the something that I can do. Now, there's only one you. You're the only person with your exact heritage. You're the only person with your life story. You're the only person who has your personal convictions, your skills, your appearance, your touch, your voice, your style, your surroundings, your sphere of influence. You're the only one who, by the grace of God, can make a difference in your world. You can make a difference in your family. You can make a difference with your husband, your wife, your children. You can make a difference with your neighbor. You can make a difference with your working associates. You make a difference with students in a school, nurses in the hospital where you work, the computer program. I am only one, but I can make a difference in my world. You know, in, in 1654, one vote gave Oliver Cromwell the control of England. In 1649, one vote caused Charles I of England to be executed. In 1776, one vote gave America the English language instead of the German language. Did you know that? If there wasn't that one vote, you may be speaking German today. You may speak it anyway. Uh, in 1839, one vote elected Marcus Morton governor of Massachusetts. In 1845, one vote, one vote brought Texas into the Union, or otherwise Texas would be part of Mexico, one vote. In 1875, one vote changed France from a monarchy to a republic. In 1876, one vote, one vote gave Rutherford B. Haynes the United States presidency. In 1923, one vote, one vote gave Adolf Hitler control of the Nazi party and it changed the world. In 1941, one vote saved the selective service system where young people are brought into the armed forces. One vote saved that system 12 weeks before Pearl Harbor. When I read the Bible, when I read God's word, I find individual men and women that made a difference for Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, we see God's hand in the lives of individuals who did what was right 
because it was right, regardless of the results, and they made a difference for God. In the Bible, we discover the power of one person, guided by the Holy Spirit, one person's influence, making a difference for God, one person's decision, changing the course of history, one person's actions, impacting the scores of other lives, one person's witness, changing their world, one person's kindness, making a difference in the lives of the people around them. Heaven's vision for a last day people is this, God's people, filled with his spirit, proclaiming his love in grace and truth everywhere, making a difference. Evil will not have the last word, God will. We look at the wars, we look at the famine, we look at the natural disasters, we look at the strife and conflict all around us. But there's something else that we look at, the promises of God's word. Let's look at some of those promises. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. In men and women, in a last day church, saved by grace, charmed by God's love, filled with his spirit, going out to make a difference in the world. That's our calling. That's our destiny. That's the purpose for which God has brought us into existence. Matthew 24, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world. Notice it doesn't say may be preached. Will be preached in all the world. As a witness to all nations, then the end will come. This is not simply a command, it's a promise. It's the promise of God that he will raise up an end time people that are so in love with Jesus that in the sphere of their influence, that one man, that one woman, that one boy, that one girl makes a difference. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Evil will not have the last word. This world will not be destroyed by some nuclear holocaust and turned into a spinning globe of ash with dead bodies across the earth. The destiny that God has for you and for me, the plan that God has, Revelation 14, verse 6, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Here's something that is urgent, having the everlasting gospel. Here's something that's eternal to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So the vision that John had is the vision of the gospel going to the ends of the earth. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. Here are the promises of God. Here is the word of the living God. Habakkuk chapter 2. You're looking there in the Bible at Habakkuk 2, and uh, we're looking there at verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world. Revelation 14, verse 6, the angel flies in the midst of heaven with the everlasting gospel to every nation, to every na nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Habakkuk chapter 2, the earth is filled with the glory of God. Now think about it. How will God accomplish this mission? Who does God use? When you look back at the first century, what do you find? God uses a fisherman filled by the Holy Spirit to baptize 3,000 in a day. Did Peter ever think five years before this time when he's casting those nets on the Sea of Galilee and pulling in fish and sorting them with stinky, smelly fishermen's hands, did he ever think that he was going to be used of God to see 3,000 baptized? What about Matthew when he was doing that tax collecting? What about Matthew when he was that accountant counting that money at the end of the day? Did he ever think that he was going to write Matthew's gospel? And 2,000 years later, you and I would be reading it? Or think about Thomas the doubter. Did he ever think that God would send him as a missionary to India, the most populous nation in the world? Or what about, 
What about those two demon-possessed young men? Did they ever think that God would send them out as the first missionaries? Two demon-possessed men that were delivered, that wanted to go with Jesus? Think about who God uses. Or what about the Samaritan woman? A woman caught in adultery with multiple husbands. Did she ever think four years before that time, five years, that she would be a missionary to Samaria and that Jesus would come there and later Philip and the whole city would be converted? Who does God use? God uses ordinary people, people like you, people like me, common, ordinary people filled with the Spirit of God to do extraordinary things. I want you to think about it. The New Testament church gathered in Jerusalem. Common, ordinary men and women. You've got Peter. You've got James and John and Mary. You've got Matthew. And as they gather, they have a danger. And the danger they have is the church is growing in Jerusalem. And the danger they have is wanting to stay where they're comfortable. The danger they have is not wanting to break out of their comfort zone. God allows persecution to come. And there's a very instructive statement in the book Acts of the Apostles, page 105. Success had attended the ministry of the word in that place. That's Jerusalem. Because you remember 3,000 were baptized. There was danger that the disciples would linger there too long. I want you to, in your mind, underline the word linger. Unmindful of the Savior's commission to go to all the world. Forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained by aggressive service. Notice two things about this. Their danger was to linger where they were comfortable. Secondly, they were forgetting something. What were they forgetting? Does it say forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained through prayer? Prayer is important. Does it say forgetting that strength to resist evil is best gained through Bible study? That's important. Why do you think this says forgetting that strength to resist evil is, be is best gained by aggressive service? Can you think of anybody in the New Testament that prayed a lot and studied the Bible a lot, but they crucified Jesus? Who was that? The Pharisees. Were the Pharisees praying a lot? Were the Pharisees studying the Bible a lot? But did they crucify Jesus? Why? Because everything was focused upon themselves. So the disciples had a danger. See, the reason God sends us out in mission, in service, to share his love with others, is not simply so they can be saved, it's so we can be saved. Because service strangles selfishness to death. As we serve others, we grow spiritually. We grow as we go. Can you say that with me? We grow as we go. Once more, we grow as we go. Now let's look at this statement as it goes on. They began to think that they had no work so important as that of shielding the church in Jerusalem from the attacks of the enemy. Instead of educating the new converts to carry the gospel to those who had not heard it, they were in danger of taking a course that we lead all to be satisfied with what had been accomplished. So have we accomplished a great deal in the last five years? God has blessed this church enormously. But is there a danger? The danger is that we come to church on Sabbath morning, that we listen to powerful messages from God's word, that we enjoy our Sabbath school, we enjoy our pathfinders, but that we focus inward on ourselves. God is leading this church to be a missionary church in this community, to be a light of the world, to plant other churches, to assist other small churches, not to simply be satisfied. Why is God leading us to do that? For two reasons. First, so that we grow spiritually. We grow as we go. Secondly, God is leading us to do that so that we will be an impact in the community. God wants to use one to reach many. 
There's Holy Spirit power that flows into the life of a godly man, a godly woman. God wants to do much, much more with our lives than we can ever imagine. Shortly, a few days ago, I was with the president of our work in China, and he was sharing this story. You know, China has 145 cities with over 1 million people in each of those 145 cities. China has 10 cities with 10 million people in it, and it has 21 cities with 5 million people. So China is incredibly populous. We have about a half a million believers in China that are Seventh-day Adventists right now. One of those cities of a million people or more had no Adventist believers in it and almost no Christians. One man got on his knees and began to pray, God, show me what you want me to do. God, whatever you want me to do, Lord, I want to do. And the Lord impressed him, move and go to that city that has a million people in it where there are no Adventists and very few Christians. He said, what should I do when I go there? I'm just a masseuse. I'm a massage expert. I don't know what to do. And uh, the Lord impressed him. Set up your massage table in the city square and offer free massages. So he set up his table and he begins massaging these people as they come. Well, he saw this old man walking up who just had had a stroke. And this old man had this cane and he's limping and limping, could hardly walk. And so he went up to him and he said, look, how would you like me to massage your leg? I think I can really help you. And the old man said, okay, massage my leg. So the guy got on the table, began to massage his leg, massage his leg, massage his leg. And the Lord began to impress this man, the man who was doing the massage. I am miraculously healing this man. Tell him to get up, drop his cane, and walk. And he said, what? Lord, I think, I, I don't know if I got that message right, Lord. Tell that man to get off the bed and walk. He's healed. So he looked at him and he said, you're healed. Get up. Walk. Throw your cane away. The man got up, threw his cane away, and began to jog. And he came back and he said, I don't know what happened, but I'm healed. He said, God just healed you. The man said, look, you got to come to my house. you got to tell my neighbors about this. you got to tell my friends about it. Today, there is a church in that house of 70 people worshiping God. You see, God wants to use one man, one woman, one boy, one girl. I think, for example, of, uh, of Jennifer in Kenya. Jennifer was an older lady. But as she wandered, as she came down the streets of her city, she noticed alcoholics. There's a guy that is drunk with alcohol here lying on the street, another one here. And she said, God, I'm just one woman. I don't know what I can do for these people. I don't know what I can do, God. But what I can do, I want to do. She began to pray about it. And the Lord impressed her with a big vision. Her vision was to establish a camp outside the city where she could bring these alcoholics where they could come and that they would, as they came out, she'd put them on a good diet, she'd get them on to exercise and walk. As they came out, she'd share with them the Bible. She had 127 alcoholics when we were there in Kenya recently. 127 alcoholics came to her camp. She began to show our programs from Nairobi, Hope for Africa. 47 of those alcoholics accepted Christ and were baptized and totally changed. One man in China made a difference in a whole city. One woman made a difference in the lives of these young, uh, of these alcoholics. One day in Africa, we were sitting, eating lunch, and I was sitting, we, uh, Pastor uh, Martin and his wife Heidi and I were sitting, eating with uh, the union president, Pastor McCordy. We began talking about children, and he began talking about orphans. And he said, Pastor Mark, I'm the father of 53 orphans. I said, what do you mean? 
He said, my wife and I, from our own salary, take these kids that have nothing, nothing. They're living in abject poverty. They are starving. They have no future. And we sponsor them to school from our own salary. One man is making a difference. You see, we, go, we grow as we go. As we go for Christ and do something out of the ordinary for him, our own spiritual experience grows dramatically. I love what it says in this book, Steps to Christ, page 80. It says this, if you will go to work as Christ designs that his disciples shall and win souls for him, what happens to me when I do that? What happens to you when you do it, when you get involved in the lives of others? You'll feel the need of a deeper experience and a greater knowledge of divine things. You'll hunger and thirst after righteousness. You'll plead with God and your faith will be strengthened. Your soul will drink deeper drafts at the well of salvation. Encountering opposition and trials will drive you to the Bible and prayer. You'll grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ and will develop a rich experience. The spirit of unselfish labor for others, what does that do? It gives depth, stability, in Christ-like loveliness to the character, brings peace and happiness to its possessor. So when you and I get involved in the lives of others, when we unselfishly serve, when we go out of ourself, we grow spiritually in ways that we could not grow otherwise. We enlarge our spiritual experience. What's that expression? We grow as we what? Go. The Holy Spirit is poured out on those that are witnessing for the Savior. But you say, wait a minute, Pastor Mark. I, I feel kind of weak. I, 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 I just don't know if I have the spiritual strength to help others. I need help myself. Or Pastor Mark, I don't know what I'd say. I don't know how to do it. this. Take your Bible, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew, the 28th chapter. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies those who he calls. When God invites you and gives you a vision of blessing others, all God's biddings are enablings. God is going to equip you. I don't know what ministry God's calling you to do, but I know God's calling you to a ministry. God is calling you personally to be actively involved in touching some other life with the grace of God. Because only you are the key to unlock the door of that heart. Only you are the one that God can use to reach that person. Now, God can work on their hearts through his Holy Spirit, sure. But God has equipped you with a unique personality. You can reach somebody that I could never reach. You can reach people that the pastor could never reach because as you come in contact with others, your, you, the uniqueness of your personality can mesh with their personality to open their heart for the gospel. Look here in Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came and spoke to them, say, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see where it says all authority there? If you have a King James version of the Bible, it doesn't say authority. What does it say? All power. You know, the New Testament is written in the, in the Greek language. And the word for power or authority, there is a Greek word called exousia. And it has to do with the triumph that Jesus had over the principalities and powers of hell. So Jesus says, when you go to share my love with others, you go with my strength, not yours. You go not in your weakness, but in my power. Take your Bible and turn back to Psalm 66, verse 3. The issue is not the spiritual strength we have. The issue, rather, is allowing God to work through us to grant to us his strength and his power. Isaiah 60, rather Psalm 66, 
verse 3. Psalm 66, verse 3. Notice what it says. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. I love that passage. How awesome are your works through the greatness of your power. So when we go to share Jesus' love, it is his power that works through us to touch another life. Look, for example, at Psalm 68, verse 35. Psalm 68, verse 35. O God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. So where does strength come from to be a powerful witness for Christ? It comes from him. So when I step out in faith to share a piece of literature, to give somebody a book, to invite somebody home for lunch, when I, and then to share Jesus with them, when I pray with that person who works on the computer next to me, when I see a nurse who's, who's struggling at the hospital where I work and I, and I share Jesus and the hope that we have in Jesus, when I do that, it's God's spirit that's working through me to strengthen me to accomplish that. I think about Letitia. Letitia. Letitia's mother was a witch. Letitia's mother's mother or grandmother was a witch. When Letitia was born, her mother took a gold chain of witchcraft and put it around her neck. Letitia, at an early age, was taught the occult arts. At a very early age, she was t taught witchcraft. She terrorized 15 African villages. These 15 villages were absolutely terrified of this one woman. She could cast a spell of evil upon them. Now look, if you're a child of God, nobody can cast a spell of evil upon you. Because he that is with us is greater than he that is with them. But these African villages believed in witchcraft. But there was one Adventist woman who saw something in Letitia that Letitia didn't see in herself. She got her arm around Letitia. She sensed that Letitia was struggling. She sensed that, that Letitia was so, uh, that she was looking for something, that she didn't have peace, that she was using this satanic power to try to make herself something that she wasn't. This lady began to pray with Letitia. She invited Letitia to our meetings. And Letitia came to Jesus. Letitia took all of her devil charms, one of the most amazing pictures that I have from Africa is a fire that's burning. And that fire is burning up all of Letitia's devil charms. Because the power of God worked through a simple Adventist woman. And by the grace of God, through God's power, that woman was changed. Jesus has given us a promise. Go to all the world. Go to your world. Your world may not be Africa. Your world may not be South America, Inter-America, but go to your world, your family, your friends, your husband that doesn't know Jesus, a wife that doesn't know Christ, children that don't know Christ, neighbors, friends. Our world is there. One person can make a difference. You can be the difference maker in your community. And here is the incredible good news. When we go, we go in Christ's power, but we go with Christ's presence. Look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. When we go, we go in the presence of Christ. We go knowing that Jesus is going to be with us. Matthew 28, verse 20. After Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, down in verse 20, he says, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you. How long is he with us? Always. Always. How long is he with us? Always. Always, even to the end of the age. When you go out to organize a small group, 
and share the word of God with others. You go to fulfill the promise of Christ. You go in the power of Christ. And you go with Christ's presence. He's there with you in that Bible study. When you go and you see that nurse whose husband has been just diagnosed with cancer and she comes in with red eyes because it's stage four and he's been told he has six months to live at most and she's been crying all night because she wonders how she's going to raise her three children under 10 years old and you put your arm around her to pray with her. You go with the presence of Christ. When you go to give out literature and your knees are knocking and your stomach is in knots as you go to that door to give out a book like Great Controversy. You go to fulfill the promise of Christ. You go in the power of Christ. You go with the presence of Christ. Christ is with you. I can't tell you the times that I've come to preach and before I come into the pulpit, sometime I was sick. I'm, I'm in Africa. Every night, not every night, but five nights, I had to go to the hospital after preaching because I had hurt my back so bad. I had, I had fallen. We were at meetings in Chesapeake Conference, and I got my feet tied around some wire, and I fell on my back and knocked something out, and I was so painful. But you know something? Every time I got up to preach, it was like the pain was gone. And I was able to preach. I sensed in those meetings the presence of Christ. Now, after the meeting, the pain came back, and I had to have that. <laughs> so I thought, man, maybe I should keep preaching all night, you know? <laughs> you sense the presence of Jesus Christ when you do Christ's service. There's something about the fellowship with Jesus that you have in service that is the most amazing thing. And I, and I think one of the greatest stories I've ever read on the presence of Christ is the story of Elizabeth Elliot. Some of you have read that story. You know the book Through Gates of Splendor by Elizabeth Elliot. Her husband was speared to death there in South America by the, in Ecuador, by an Indian tribe they were trying to reach. There were five of those missionaries that came, and uh, there was a tribe that had never heard the gospel. And they spent a number of weeks dropping gifts to this tribe. And as they dropped gifts to the tribe, they thought that they had developed a relationship with the tribe. So they landed on this jungle strip, not knowing that the tribe would react violently against them. Before they left, they sung this song together. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. Thine is the battle. Thine shall be the praise. When passing through the gates of pearly splendor, victors we rest with thee through endless days. They were speared to death. Their bodies were found floating there in the Curati River. After that time, Elizabeth Elliot had to make a decision. What would she do? What would she do with a, with a young child? What would she do now with the rest of her life? She decided to stay and not to go. She met in a village two of these Indian women from the tribe that killed her husband. One of them was named Dayuma. And as she began to learn more about Dayuma, Dayuma taught her the language of that Kurati tribe. Finally, there was an opening. And Elizabeth Elliot went to live with the tribe that speared her husband to death. And the question was, why? Why would this young woman, whose husband has been speared to death, why would she go with this tribe? Why would she stay there? There's one reason. She believed that the presence of Christ had called her to make a difference with those Indian children. 
She believed in the promise of Christ that the gospel would go to all the world before Jesus comes. She believed in the power of Christ, the promise, the power of Christ, that Christ's power would be with her. But she believed particularly and distinctly that the presence of Christ would be with her. The power of one. One woman made a difference in an entire tribe who became converted. The power of one. You're not some insignificant speck of dust on a planet called Earth. You were shaped by God, fashioned by God, made by God. And by the grace of God, you can make a difference for his kingdom. Because one man, one woman, one boy, one girl can change the world around them. Deep within your heart, would you like to say, Lord, I want to be that one man. I want to be that one woman. I want to make a difference for the grace of Christ in the people around me. And as you do, you will grow spiritually and you'll be that light of the world that Jesus has called you to be. Let's pray together. Oh, my Father, sometimes we downplay our own influence. Sometimes we feel so insignificant we fail to recognize that through the power of Christ, we can make a difference in the world around us. Oh, Lord, help us to sense your promise that the gospel will go to the ends of the earth. Help us to sense that the power is not in us, but in you. That you're not calling us to be fully qualified. You're calling us to be available. Lord, this week, help us to be available to you. Available to let you work through us. Open our eyes to see the needs of people around us. Help us to be able to make a difference in their lives. Teach us, Lord, that as we witness for you, your presence is with us and will never, ever, ever let us go. In Jesus' name, amen.